This is the new TC Pride Podcast, episode 95, on location at First Unitarian Society with Skylark Opera Theater. Twin Cities Pride Podcast on location at First Unitarian Society in Minneapolis with some folks from Skylark Opera Theater to talk about a production that they have coming up uh, very soon. Uh, Would you introduce yourselves, please? I'm Deb Irvin, the stage manager. Hi, I'm Bob New. I'm the stage director and the artistic director of Skylark. I'm Jeff Sterling. I'm the music director. I'm Vera Mariner, and I'm the marketing and communications manager. So we'll talk about the production in just a few minutes here, but for people that don't know anything about Skylark um, Opera Theater, uh, what would you like them to know about the organization? We're an organization that is all about making opera accessible um, and intimate. So we work in unusual spaces. We work on a very intimate scale. We work only in English, and we do both uh, the standard repertoire and very unusual repertoire. Yeah, and another way that was kind of presented as we were setting up here and, and, and chit-chatting a little beforehand uh, was you're, you're kind of kind of tongue-in-cheek presenting Skylark Opera Theater as kind of the anti-opera, uh, right? It's, it's kind of to kind of challenge uh, misconceptions that people might have about opera in general. It's not your grandfather's opera. <laughs> Well, yeah, I think people have, some people are intimidated by opera and think it's very formal and something they won't understand. And and we try to make sure that that's not true in our productions, that that we're accessible and that we're, uh, what we do is moving to people. And there's something really interesting that happens when you're in a, a very intimate space. You can feel the singers if they're this close to you. You can smell them maybe. I mean that all your senses are heightened as a result of this kind of experience, unlike being on a stage. With a traditional opera production, the singers are literally far from the audience. They are separated. Uh, the orchestra pit is in between them. There's this, there's this gulf. But what Skylark does is it brings the performers and the audience face to face, close together, and, and, and that w- makes it so much more visceral and physical. And, and you just, you know, you feel somebody singing, you know, two feet from you, not 20 yards. <laughs> And we were talking a little also here before we started about how stage managers are often the unsung heroes <laughs> of live performances. Um, and I would assume that working in sort of non-traditional opera spaces would present some unique challenges. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a new game every time. I think Bob and I have worked together on five or six shows now, and every time it's been a new venue. Uh, and traditionally, our dress rehearsals have been like glorious, spectacular train wrecks. <laughs> I mean that in the best possible way, but you have to figure out like a whole new landscape every time. Yeah, it's 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 not traditional, and and you're right that that stage managers the unsung the unsung heroes. If people don't know theater, what stage managers do is they make the show run. They take the director's ideas and then they filter everything down into the practicality so that your show can run. When the director leaves after opening night, it's the stage manager who makes sure that everything goes smoothly. So it's up to Deb to just think of a thousand details that you don't have to think about in a traditional theater, and that's why we use her because she's amazing at this. She's really, really great at it. And would taking a non-traditional approach to opera uh, present some musical challenges as well? Well, yes, the, uh, the repertoire that Skylark does uses different uh, instrumental forces. You know, some works are done just with a piano. This one, the one we're doing as one, is composed for two singers and only a string quartet. So that, that's a, a whole different uh, uh, kind of challenge to, to balance the, the two voices and four instrumentalists. And, and as far as like generating sort of support from the community and like getting, getting the marketing out there to the community, what, what kind of challenges have been presented um, in that area? Um, not really challenges because I decided to go for it and I decided to really pursue the community and reach out to organizations that, that are of service to the marginalized. We, 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 we pitch to Lavender because they are an integral part of the LGBT community, and we knew that this piece was completely and utterly relevant and timely, and met with Barry Levitt, and he signed on immediately. He was very impressed with, 
I think our willingness to produce a piece like this and that it would speak to the community. And we've had a beautiful relationship ever since. And he also introduced us to Alan Krug, who I can't say enough about. And we've created kind of a, a, a huge holistic experience with this piece in that we're going to have piece, we're going to perform the piece. It'll be art. But then we're having post-show discussions afterwards with members of the community. For example, the first night we're going to have Ellen Krug, who is the wondrous public, national public speaker on inclusivity in the workplace. The composer is coming in from New York. We'll have the cast. But on uh, Saturday night, we will have One Voice Mixed Chorus Transgender Voices Festival representatives talking about their upcoming festival in April. And then on um, the 18th, we're having Rebecca Wagner, who is the executive director of Quorum, which is the LGBT Chamber of Commerce. And then the following week, I'm really excited, on Friday the 23rd, we will have the executive director and one of the um, therapists in-house for Reclaim. And that'll be a really special night because they offer services, mental health services to queer and trans youth. And, you know, we're, we're going to really talk to them about how would Hannah, in the, our character in the story, how would she have gone into the Reclaim system and been helped? Because she did it on her own, and we'll talk about that. And then, uh, Bob, would you like to pick up on, on anything that was said about uh, presenting to, like, the live audience? Well, I mean, I don't know. I, it, we haven't really established the fact that this piece we're doing as one is the first opera that has to do with transgenderism, which, you know, and I think one of the main reason we're excited about this piece is that I think people think that the fine arts and opera aren't relevant to society today. I think a lot of people think of opera as people in powdered wigs and long dresses and things taking place, you know, in the 18th century. You know, and what does that have to do with me right now? But that's why we're excited because this piece is about one person's journey um, th th through his and then her life in finding one's true self. And the fact that it's set in contemporary times and is about a subject that is so in the news these days because of what's happening in, in Washington um, and what's happening around our country in terms of, of inclusivity and people's um, dealing with their prejudices. This is why we're excited, I think, about this piece, is that it talks to the here and now and we want to convince people that the fine arts can do that. They can talk to us here, now, and present day. Uh, while you think of opera as having music, in, the, in Skylark's name is theater. You know, it's first of all theater, uh, an experience of an audience and performers. Uh, but this has an additional component. Uh, it has a video component that is uh, there is going to be projected during the performance. And uh, the video is made by a trans woman mm -hmm. uh, who, uh, whose story is in, in large part the inspiration for this particular uh, c composition for the composer. And of course, we're, we're actually meeting today at First Unitarian where the rehearsals are taking place, but the actual venue is gonna be in St. Paul. And you know, for anybody that's experienced opera or live theater, oftentimes the venue can kind of become a character in itself, or it becomes a very important part of the, the presentation. Maybe you can tell uh, people a little bit about the actual venue where they'll be performing. Um yeah, yeah, you know, we're another thing we're excited about is we're um, the first opera that's being performed in this brand new theater space in town called North Garden Theater in St. Paul. This was a movie theater, a neighborhood movie theater that's been renovated into a big black box theater. Um, the capacity is 180. That's another thing that we do at Skylark is we try to keep our capacities very small so it remains intimate. And it's just this wonderful big room that we're kind of inaugurating with with our opera, which we're excited about. And, and Deb, we were talking about how you kind of represent, among this group here, of, of someone that wasn't necessarily a fan of opera to begin with. Yeah, my background is in experimental theater, although I've done a lot with dance and burlesque. Um, when I first met Bob, it was in 2015 working on Carousel, and we ended up continuing to work together because he um, likes to be playful to try new things, to try new venues, to push the envelope of what um, people might expect from traditional 
operas. And, um, you know, I wasn't a fan of the classics in any sense, but when we got into rehearsal and we've gotten a few shows under our belts, what I saw from opera, especially in an intimate form, is um, the music, the way it's set up, allows the characters to express feelings in a way that, that I feel. When the emotions are too big for your own body, that's what I get from opera. And it's the most moving thing. Um, working with Bob and Skylark, it has unlocked access to a whole new world of art for me. <laughs> What's been interesting with Deb is because we're all Facebook addicted, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram people. Deb's growth process and learning process and the sense of discovery as she has stage managed these, these shows has been in writing. You know, when you discover some new, uh, you know, like a, a new word or a new definition or some new technique, or and it's this sense of wonder that you bring to the page, and it's been really wonderful to see your development. Now you're an expert. Well, and I think for me, I, I've been in this business for quite a while, and, and Deb, since we're not in a visual medium at the moment, Deb is very hip, 20-something, like, totally like with the program has got it going on and it's been really inspirational to me to see the people who we often think aren't going to relate to what we do you know really as she just so beautifully articulated really moved by this art form that I've been involved with a long time and sometimes take for granted so this the fresh perspective that she's brought us has been you know really exciting for us too and, and maybe you can sort of encapsulate sort of the musical feeling of, of the piece overall a little bit? Well, the, the piece is in three large sections, but they flow from one section to the next in the form of basically songs, extended songs that the composer has written. Uh, some feature one of the characters more than others. Some are duets. Uh, and so the, uh, the musical style uh, mixes and matches the different moods of the piece. Uh, there's a portion, for instance, uh, of the piece that involves Christmas time and the holidays and family and those things that are can be quite challenging to in in the best of times. And so the composer uh, quotes well-known Christmas carols and involves the string quartet. Those members that aren't playing at that particular moment are asked to, in fact, sing the Christmas carols in the background while the characters are are, are reading letters uh, from their parents. And uh, so the, the musical style uh, uh, is a mix of, of uh, very free emotional music. The, uh, the viola player in the string quartet, the quartet is two violins, a violist and a cellist. And the violist often is given the role of the main character's inner emotional life. And so the viola player's uh, solos kind of project what Hannah is going through or what she is going to go through, you know, in foreshadowing and things like that. And Bob, could you maybe give us sort of a, a broader scope of, of the production overall, please? Well, sure. The, you know, the piece is just an hour and 20 minutes with no intermission. It's very concise. And, and it's a piece that doesn't have a plot per se. It's a character study. It's, and what's so interesting and unique about it is it's, you know, this is about a, a man who is transitioning to female. So there's, there's one character really called Hannah before and Hannah after. So the before is played by a baritone, a, a male singer, and the after is performed by a female singer. Now, both characters are on stage through the entire opera be, because the, you know, the, there are two sides of one person. And that's a really interesting kind of unique sort of theatrical take on, on this person's journey. So it just really kind of traces um, this young boy at 14 trying to figure out why he feels different, why he's not fitting in at school, you know, what his journey is about, and making these discoveries um, and finding, finding the name for what he's feeling, and then deciding to, um, to go ahead and make the transition to female. And then we see Hannah um, at the, um, well, I was almost going to say the end of her journey, but that's silly. It's not the end of her journey, but it's, it's as she has transitioned to female and started to realize what this new world is, is for her. And, and having a certain amount of relief of, of um, you know, becoming 
as one, a complete person and understanding what her truth is. And so we mentioned that Lavender is the media sponsor for the production, but uh, the money for Skylark Opera Theater actually comes from a few different places. Well, it comes from a lot of different places. We're like every other nonprofit um, arts organization in the Twin Cities. We raise money from foundations, from corporations, from individuals. So, um, you know, it's just we all are out there raising money for our art. We're not unique in that. We all wish we had more money. We all wish we didn't have to work as hard to raise money. But that's, you know, that's the world we live in, and that's, that's fine. You appreciate that you can make your art that much more when you've had to work so hard to raise the money. But we have wonderful sponsors. Um, you know, Target is so generous to the arts in town. Um, the State Arts Board is amazing. So we have, and we have a lot of individuals who, who are very generous as well. And we we were talking about kind of one of the main goals of this entire production is to make opera more accessible to people in general. And and the music is a big part of that. Well, this is uh, Laura Kaminsky's first opera. And and she's, uh, you know, admitted entirely that that it's been a learning process for her as well. Uh, And the the choice of string quartet and singers is an uh, unconventional one uh, for opera. But the idea that the uh, that the story would be told in linked songs uh, is is a very uh, contemporary one. You know, you can imagine uh, going to a, a, a review at a at a club and the singers will get on stage and they will sing a linked series of songs that will tell a story, uh, each song being a vignette. And as Bob was saying before about the way uh, the character's life is laid out in sort of snapshots. Okay, here's Hannah delivering, delivering papers on his paper route as a kid. Here's Hannah, you know, in a coffee shop writing uh, writing in her journal, you know, uh, those sorts of things. Here's Hannah on vacation, uh, you know, taking a boat out on the lake. So uh, it gives the composer an opportunity to paint a lot of pictures, a lot of, uh, you know, some of the music, you can hear the young boy's bicycle in the music. You can hear the, the wheels and the bicycle going on. And, and so the composer is, is not stuck in any particular kind of style. Some of it sounds, uh, as you mentioned before, it sounds like Christmas carols. Other parts of it sound like, uh, you know, uh, a little bit techno, <laughs> you know, with the motoric rhythms. And, uh, and others are, are big, arching, gorgeous, you know, the kind of uh, melodies you'd associate with Puccini, you know, and, and, and just grand opera, you know, ballads. So, so the, the, uh, the, stylistic, uh, the stylistic variety is one of the great assets of this piece, you know, because when you only have two singers, you think, well, you know, just two singers, it's going to be boring, it's just the same two voices. But since the composer puts them in so many different uh, contexts and with such interesting different kinds of... Uh, uh, accompaniments that uh, it, it, it takes advantage of this kind of um, uh, mosaic of musical styles, which I think, you know, you may find, oh, you know, that one of the, one of the sections doesn't grab you right away, but then the next one does. You know, it has a, has a, a point of entry for you, and then you get involved in the, in the story and the character and, and her development, and uh, the music is really in, supports that and is service of that. Uh, from being a, a listener today and uh, watching the piece, this is an, it, the piece is an embarrassment of riches in that there are all these songs, as Jeff said, that are all linked together. However, each song aesthetically has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. So one after the other, after the you're fulfilled beyond your wildest imagination because you're getting all these beginning, middle, ends, one after another after another. And the other thing is about the palette that the composer choice chose to compose this piece, the musical palette, I wouldn't hear it any other way ever. You completely, you, you completely accept what you're hearing because you can't imagine it to be any other way. We gotta say a, a, a big thank you to our two singers, Luke and Bergen, who are uh, Hannah, uh, before and Hannah after, these two fantastic young artists that uh, inhabit this music. It's, it's not easy to learn uh, something that's completely new, but they, they sing it as if they've been singing it their whole lives. They've I, 
identified with the characters and with the these beautiful vocal lines and and these playful moments you know it's it, it's it's funny it's serious it's uh, you know yeah and it, it it's sometimes intense but uh, but uh, it's life you know and but these two are, have really uh, done such a fantastic job you know that's a big challenge when you put on new work is to is to uh, is to find folks that are willing to to, to dive in, you know, dive in with both feet and just see what happens. And then we've been really blessed by these two uh, and their their talent in, the, in this regard. And we talked about how the goal of production is to make opera accessible for people who aren't typically interested in opera. And as someone who's younger and in that group of people who the production is trying to reach, you'd say that the production has accomplished uh, that, at least for you? Oh my goodness, yes. Um, I watch Luke and Bergen, and they take my breath away every rehearsal. Their their voices are so beautiful together. The music, um, it's a little bit, in my head, I think about slowcore music, like Lo from Duluth or Kid Dakota locally, where it takes a couple passes to appreciate the complexity and the beauty of it. And in my role as stage manager, getting to sit in on rehearsals, I get that that level of familiarity, and it's just gorgeous music. And as a wrap up here, we wanted to give people some general information about the production and how they can come and enjoy it. Sure. We're, um, we're again at North Garden Theater, and we open March 16th and close the 25th. We have six performances during that period every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, tickets are available at ticketworks.com. And uh, the tickets, the other thing that Skylark does, we make sure our ticket prices are very affordable. And we also wanted to let people know about how they can support Skylark Opera Theater and their future productions uh, going forward. Well, you can support Skylark Opera Theater by attending a show, for one thing, by spreading the word, by sharing our stories on social media, on your social media platforms, and for donations, givemin.org, G-I-V-E-M-N.org, is a place where you can just donate online. And also stay in touch with us on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter under Skylark Opera Theater. We're very social media savvy, chitty chatty. We do a lot of, a lot of stuff on social media. We tell the story there, and there's always an opportunity to find out more and more and more about us on social media. And is there anything else that like anyone else would like to kind of leave people with as we, as we wrap up here? Give opera a chance. Don't be intimidated by it. Um, I promise you that if you come to this production, I can't say that you'll love it because who am I to say that, but you're going to understand it and you're going to feel that you've experienced something that's make, that makes you think and, and, and gives you an insight into maybe a world that you're not completely familiar with. Well, thank you very much, all of you, for your time today. Good luck with the production, and uh, I hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thanks. Thank you. The TC Pride Podcast is a production of Podletter Media and Twin Cities Pride. Subscribe now on iTunes, on Android, or by email at tcpridepodcast.org. Get above the noise by raising your voice. Podletter Media turns your email newsletter, blog, or video content into a more powerful, more personal, more intimate, on-demand listening experience. Your podcast. Your story. Your voice. Simplified. Amplified. Learn more now at podletter.com.